Uh, my name is Karen Schoen. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology, and um, I am a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee of Graduate Medical Sciences, or short GMS, as we call it here, um, at the BU School of Medicine. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging are core values of academic excellence central to BU's mission. As part of BU's efforts to enhance these values at BU, faculty search committees have started to request diversity statements from faculty applicants as part of the faculty hiring process. Although several rubrics have been developed to assess faculty candidate contributions to diversity that are freely available online, there are currently no guidelines at BU regarding how to interpret or assess these statements, how much weight to give them in the decision-making process, and their contribution to fostering a more diverse faculty that is reflective of the student body. So I invite you today to listen and learn from panelists from BU, Columbia, Cornell, and Emory as they discuss why diversity statements are needed from faculty candidates, what content to look for, and whether they should be mandatory. The panelists will share best practices for reviewing and weighing faculty diversity statements during the faculty hiring process and will answer questions from the audience. This panel is supported by an inclusion uh, catalyst grant from the US Office of Diversity and Inclusion and by GMS and the GMS Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee. I would like to thank the sponsors for making this panel possible. And in particular, I'd like to thank the panelists and highlighting, I also would like to highlight the unwavering support of the amazing Teresa Davis, who has been busy working in the background. Um, so we are very excited to host four expert panelists today who have kindly agreed to serve on the panel. Each panelist will speak for 10 minutes, which is then followed by a panel discussion that I will moderate. Please enter your questions in the chat and Teresa and I will, be, will do our best to relay the questions to the panelists. Note that the panel will be recorded we will now take a few, I will now take a few minutes to introduce the four panelists in the order that they will present. The first panelist is Dr. Seth Marnan, JD of Columbia University. Dr. Marnan is a leader and advocate in higher education and the law. He serves as director of training and education for Columbia's Office of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action. Dr. Marnin earned his BA in Women's Studies and Sociology and his MA in Liberal Studies from the University at Albany SUNY and his JD from the University of, Conne of Connecticut School of Law. The second panelist is Dr. Charles Chang, PhD, who is an Associate Professor at the Department of Linguistics here at BU. He is also the Chair of the Equity and Inclusion Committee of BU's Faculty Council and serves on the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee of the Department of Linguistics at BU. Dr. Chen, Chen, Chang received his PhD in linguistics from the University of California at Berkeley. The third panelist is Dr. Dibulina Roy, PhD. Dr. Roy is, a, is the, the Senior Associate Dean of Faculty for Emory College of Arts and Sciences and a Professor of Neuroscience and Behavioral Biology and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Emory University. Dr. Roy received her PhD in reproductive neuroendocrinology and molecular biology from the Institute of Medicine, Medical Science at the University of Toronto. The fourth panelist is Dr. Chelsea Specht, PhD. Dr. Specht is the Barbara McClintock Professor of Plant Biology and the inaugural Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell University. Before joining Cornell University, Dr. Specht served as a faculty equity advisor for the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology and is chair of the Academic Senate Committee of Diversity, Equity, and Campus Climate at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Specht received a PhD from NYU. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our panelists. Dr. Manin will start us off today. Dr. Manin, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I am going to share my screen. And if somebody could give me a thumbs up that you can see the top front panel, that would be thank you so much. Um, yes. Thank you for the warm introduction. Um, I know this has been a session build 
as uh, why diversity statements are needed and how to use them. But before getting into diversity, diversity statements specifically, I'd like to frame my thoughts about the conversation and put diversity statements into the category of best practices in recruiting and hiring. And at the end of the day, diversity statements are really just one tool of many that we have to attract, evaluate, and retain the best and the brightest faculty who can contribute to campus diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice on our campuses. Um, but I don't think that diversity statements can stand on their own. Rather, I think they need to be used with other best practices that I call structural strategies to achieve this goal. And when I talk about structural strategies, I'm distinguishing these tools or strategies um, and the, the ones that I'm suggesting, including diversity statements from the various kinds of individual or mind changing or awareness strategies like implicit uh, or other types of anti-bias training that you sometimes see in this arena. Um, the goal of these structural strategies is to make as many of the subjective decisions objective or as objective as possible and to eliminate or at least reduce the number of discretion points where bias and other subjective factors can play a role. We can't get rid of all of our biases and especially the unconscious ones are particularly challenging, but we can create some guardrails that will help us to interrupt them. And so before I get to diversity statements, what are the other steps or strategies? The first, it starts with the committee and at minimum there should be one and departments should think about who is on the committee. Is the committee diverse or as diverse as your department can be at the time? Uh, are there folks who should be on the committee who aren't and does everyone have an equal vote? Um, think about whether you've addressed power imbalances on the committee. Um, if there are significant power imbalances that go unaddressed, it doesn't matter how careful the selection process is, how diverse the committee is, uh, whether or not there's a diversity statement that is asked for. Um, if the committee chair or another committee member has all the power, the process won't work like it should. Uh, many suggest having a diversity advocate, someone who's tasked with supporting the committee's efforts to ensure that com the committee is using best practices to attract and recruit and evaluate and ultimately select the best candidates. Um, and this is especially helpful if your department does not have sufficient diversity to have a particularly diverse committee. Um, however, I would say that the diversity advocate ideally will not be the only woman or the only underrepresented minority on the committee, um, and nor will they be the only one doing all the work. Rather, imagine them more as a quarterback. You still need the other players on the team. Then there's the job description itself, and it's important to establish objective criteria for the position description and limit it to the must-haves. There are different theories about using a required preferred model. Some say having preferred qualifications has the potential to expand your pool and attract more in different candidates. I'm going to make a different argument. I think including preferred qualifications can create a kind of noise that's confusing when actually evaluating candidates. Um, if you have three must-haves and six nice-to-haves and a candidate who seems super exciting has the six nice-to-haves but only one or two of the must-haves, they sort of look like a great candidate, except not really. And it requires thinking critically about the position you're hiring for. Um, the bottom line is know what you want and what you need and waive those criteria rarely um, and require an explanation for those exceptions and then keep track of long-term waiving trends. Research shows that the objective rules tend to be applied rigorously to outgroups, but more leniently to in-groups. Insist on a diverse pool of candidates. Be clear from the outset that you want true diversity, not just one minority candidate or one woman in departments where there are few to no women. Research shows that the odds of hiring a woman are 79 times as great if at least two women are in your finalist pool. And the odds of hiring a non-white candidate are 194 times as great with at least two finalists who are minority candidates. So how do you get your diverse pool? Start with digging into the data, and I'm imagining that there is an office at BU that can help with this. What could the potential pool even look like? This should be a fair process, both to the committee and candidates alike. 
Um, and there are some areas or disciplines where there are very few candidates of color or very few women uh, in the field or with the required credentials. And so to expect something like half of the candidate pool to include underrepresented minorities would be unrealistic and unattainable. So understanding what the pool looks like could create more realistic expectations. Um, limit referral hiring. If your department is homogeneous, hiring from those networks will typically perpetuate that homogeneity. Instead, you need to be actively recruiting. For example, you need to be strategic about where you share advertisements in publications that target underrepresented groups, for example. Uh, reach out to professional organizations serving diverse groups and historically Black colleges and universities to place advertisements with them. Diversifying a pool may also mean actively reaching out to a particular individual who would be an exceptional candidate, even when it's a cold call, and inviting them to apply. And if they're uninterested, there can be value in asking them for other names to consider. A longer term strategy is for universities to grow their own candidates, ideally for several universities to be doing this and to invest in diversifying their graduate programs. It's sometimes referred to as building a pipeline. It's a longer term strategy that will help increase the pool of candidates in the future. There are also structural strategies that you can employ once you begin to review applications. You can de-identify applications to the extent possible. Um, bias in hiring has been extensively documented. One study, a candidate named Jamal needed eight more years of experience than a candidate named Greg to be seen as equally qualified. Another study found that men from elite backgrounds were called back for interviews more than 12 times as often as identical candidates from non-elite backgrounds. So to the extent that you can eliminate names and other signifiers at this stage of consideration, research shows that the pool will remain more diverse for longer. And the longer your pool remains diverse, the more likely those candidates will end up in your final rounds. Um, but I want to be clear here, though, this is a burdensome best practice, because I, I know at Columbia, this is the case, and at many other institutions that I've talked to, um, application systems don't have an automated way to de-identify applications, and so it would most likely need to be a manual process. Now, because you wrote a great job posting and you have your must-haves, you can eliminate applications that don't meet the minimum threshold, your must-haves, whether that's holding a particular degree, the requisite number of years of teaching, a language requirement or field of research or whatever else you've included. Also, don't fall back on name brands as proxies. To the extent possible, de-identify schools. It's sufficient to know that someone possesses the credential. And even publications. Don't rely on the shorthand of where articles were published. Read and evaluate the scholarship. You should also develop and use a matrix to evaluate candidates. That is, create and use a tool so that the committee members have a shared understanding of what is being evaluated and how it's being evaluated. A well-crafted job description can help you in creating the evaluation tool. Now, this is just a sample, and any of these things can be modified or tweaked to fit whatever search you're doing. But for our purposes today, assume that research is a requirement for the position you're hiring for. What's the content of the candidate's research, and how closely is it or is it not aligned to what you're looking for? Has the candidate received grants presented at professional conferences? What are their research plans? And if research is more important than anything else, it can be weighted to reflect that. And that's a shared, that's a conversation that the committee has about weighting. Um, same thing for teaching. Think about the ways someone might satisfy these qualifications and consider how to evaluate them. For demonstrated contributions to DEIJ, you'll be examining whether and how a candidate has made contributions in the diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice area. Very importantly, you'll be evaluating their record of accomplishment, not their identity. So how do you know whether a candidate has made contributions in this area? Glad you asked. This is where diversity statements come in. And asking candidates for a diversity statement encourages all candidates, not just Black, Indigenous, or other people of color, to reflect on their work and experiences and to share how they contribute. Candidates can be asked for a standalone diversity statement, similar to the research or teaching statements candidates are often asked for, or you can ask that it be included in a cover letter. And for each of these areas, and particularly for DEIJ work, you'll want to develop a rubric that will help you to evaluate each of these criteria. So again, you're all working off of a shared understanding of what you are evaluating and how you're evaluating it, because you don't want to rely on gut feelings or instinct. 
So here's a sample rubric that you can use to evaluate diversity statements. Uh, for example, you can assess uh, and rank a candidate's DEI knowledge on a one to five scale. To be most useful, the rubric, rubric will provide several examples of responses that would constitute a particular value. So again, you're working off the same understanding of what would constitute an excellent answer versus a good answer versus a meh answer. Same for track record, again, broken down by range with examples to guide evaluators, and for plans for advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. By having a rubric like this, you're eliminating some of those discretion points and helping the committee focus in on what you've decided matters, and you have a shared understanding of how to evaluate applications. And I want to say that I don't think there is anything wrong with transparency here around diversity statements. Uh, my office's website includes information not only for our search committees, but for candidates as well, so that if or when they're being asked to submit a diversity statement, and I'll mention here that Columbia does not, if they are not mandatory at Columbia, some departments require them, some do not. Um, but when, it can, when they are required, the candidate will have a sense of what they are being asked for and how they'll be evaluated. Um, and finally, I think that having the equivalent of a morbidity and mortality conference in m, &M can be useful for departments to evaluate how the search went. Um, was the department able to diversify its faculty or where despite their efforts, uh, they did not succeed in doing so? The purpose of an m, &M conference here as elsewhere is to provide an opportunity to identify areas of improvement. Um, there's no finger pointing or punishing anyone. It's an opportunity to ask and answer questions in order to do better in the future. Um, in analyzing how the search went, consider each step. Is the department unable to attract a diverse pool of candidates in the first place? Are there best practices that aren't being followed? Um, is that the committee level or some other issue that has yet to be addressed? Um, and I want to be clear here, none of this is like immunization with a one and done solution. And indeed, we have learned, if nothing else, over the last few, few years, immuniz immunizations themselves aren't one and done. Um, but these are structural strategies that you can use to attract and retain the best and the brightest faculty who can contribute to campus diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, thanks so much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it off to the next panelist. Thank you very much, Dr. Marnin. Uh, the next panelist is Charles Chang. All right, I'm going to <clears throat> share my screen too. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Marnin, for the very expansive overview. Um, I'm going to um, take a little bit of a different approach. Um, <clears throat> I'm a faculty member here at uh, BU. I just make sure I don't go over time. <laughs> um, and I have um, needed to write um, diversity statements um, and also to evaluate them on search committees. And um, where I'm going to kind of begin is just the data from my own experience uh, uh, applying for jobs. So um, <clears throat> these are the two most recent times I applied for academic jobs. <laughs> uh, so these are tenure track faculty positions. Um, so the first time was, um, I guess, what, like 15-ish years ago, uh, where I put in, <clears throat> so this was towards the end of graduate school, where I put in eight job applications, variety of places. This is just when I started um, putting in job applications, uh, the first of many years <laughs> putting in job applications where um, <clears throat> I went back to my files to just check like, you know, did I actually have to write a diversity statement at that time? And uh, I, I, it, I was actually surprised that that, um, that year, I, I, there were no searches actually that required a diversity statement from me. Um, <clears throat> the most recent time I applied for jobs, which was about five years ago, I put in more applications also a variety of places around the world. And um, <clears throat> this was the time when I, I recall um, <clears throat> needing to write a diversity statement. So um, now, you know, actually, I, I guess probably since 2020, 2021, uh, I think it's even more common to actually ask for a diversity statement. But the point of me showing this data is basically um, <clears throat> to make the point that um, requiring a separate diversity statement is still like, not nearly uh, consistently required across searches. And so that's, I think, um, 
uh, one one initial thing that that search committees can kind of wrap their heads around whether they're going to ask for this or not because um, even you know starting a few years ago um, this seems to be not necessarily the norm. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> so what are search committees asking for in a DEI statement? So I've just um, put here a sample request that I remember seeing from Harvard, <clears throat> and Harvard is just one example, but like many search committees would would uh, have a, a prompt that is similar to this. So they basically ask for you know a research statement and a teaching statement, and then also a statement describing in this case efforts to encourage diversity, inclusion, and belonging, including past, current, and anticipated future com contributions um, in these areas. So it's pretty short the prompt. Um, BU recently ran a, a postdoc search. Um, <clears throat> where they also asked um, for a diversity and inclusion statement. This, I think, was actually a little bit unusual because, you know, when I applied for postdocs, you know, which was several years ago, I don't remember needing to um, uh, uh, write a diversity statement for any of those searches. So I think this is sort of advancing. <clears throat> um, so the prompt here is longer and it asks for um, <clears throat> uh, evidence of that applicants <clears throat> demonstrated commitment and contributions to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion through scholarship, teaching, service, and or outreach, outreach activities. That part I thought was interesting because service and outreach are sort of um, uh, being put into separate categories. Um, applicants are encouraged to include their personal experiences with diversity, in, uh, including but not limited to their experience, perhaps as a member of an underrepresented group, their engagement with diverse communities, and or any professional training in diversity, diversity and inclusivity. So, um, I'm not arguing that this is a better prompt, but I think one thing that is nice about this prompt is it sort of um, just kind of provides some additional examples of what someone could talk about in, in this type of statement. Um, <clears throat> um, getting back to the basic question of what are the benefits of requesting a separate DEI statement? Because as we just saw in the data that I presented earlier, this is actually, you know, maybe even still today, like not necessarily the norm. Um, and you do see um, job ads that ask for comments on DEI, but like woven into the other materials, like the candidate is welcomed to comment on DEIJ or DEI uh, in their cover letter and in their teaching statement and their research statement and so on, but there's not a, a separate statement being asked for. So I think there's a couple of benefits. <clears throat> the first being that it just um, kind of shines a light on DEI, that it, it, it kind of devotes greater attention to the role of a DEI in the search process, um, which is to say like, not just research and teaching are getting their own statements, but also DEI is, is kind of meriting a separate um, uh, kind of deliberate uh, uh, kind of uh, set of thoughts about um, uh, past and uh, uh, past experience and also future plans. Um, and I think that this um, personally, will make it easier to evaluate because, you know, um, asking for these sorts of comments to be weaved throughout the other materials really gives candidates a lot of, um, I, what you're going to end up with, I think, is a lot of variability in terms of the extent to which this is commented upon, uh, and also how it is actually commented upon in the course of um, writing up the other materials, which is to say, yeah, I think it will actually be easier on the committee um, in the end to ask for a separate um, statement. <clears throat> Okay, so some challenges, um, and these are challenges that <coughs> I have sort of confronted <laughs> in my recent experience uh, evaluating um, these sorts of separate DEI statements. Um, one is that even in the type of longer, more, more uh, in some ways, more specific prompt that um, you saw from BU, <coughs> people can interpret the request for a separate diversity statement in kind of vastly different ways. And I'll, I'll show a couple of examples in a minute of uh, what I mean by that. And um, <clears throat> this is challenging because it makes it, uh, you know, even if you have a rubric, it makes it um, uh, difficult to evaluate um, what may look like apples and oranges, essentially. The second thing is that, um, right, the, the committee might not really even have a rubric. So this is why I think it was great um, for Dr. Martin to show this example of a quite detailed rubric um, that can reduce um, 
the inconsistency in evaluating these statements that you could see across different committees. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's some examples of what I mean. Even with the prompt that you saw from BU, it's like people were answering a different assignment. They, they were responding to a different assignment. So, um, and, and you know, I'm not quoting here, but I'm just providing some examples of the type of types of things that I uh, saw. So, <clears throat> one approach to a DEI statement is to basically focus it on teaching, essentially to make it a kind of second teaching statement, but a, a, a teaching statement where you basically talk about how you kind of uh, how your teaching uh, practice connects to DEI in various ways. So <clears throat> there are some statements that I <clears throat> read in the last search that I was on that made comments like the following. I have lots of underrepresented minority students in my lab. <clears throat> there are lots of women in my classes, like the person could be a STEM professor, for example, where, you know, women would be underrepresented. Um, <clears throat> I, in my, you know, uh, teaching practice, I try to uh, uh, teach in a way or design materials in a way that it will accommodate different kinds of learning uh, preferences. Um, we'll circle back to um, issues with, with some of these points in a second. <laughs> but um, the, the second half, the, the, the second example here on the slide concerns a, a different like interpretation of the request where the person has basically focused on their DEI work in the service realm, and they've described, for example, um, uh, uh, special outreach trips that they've made to Puerto Rico to recruit, uh, you know, students into STEM areas. Um, they've descri uh, described work as a faculty advisor to um, an underrepresented student group, um, and maybe they've, you know, for example, served on a committee that um, does advocacy work to increase ethnic diversity in the discipline. So this could be another type of statement. Um, and these are very different types of statements. <laughs> um, and so even, even with some conversations beforehand on the part of the committee about how to evaluate these types of statements, I think this is um, a challenge here, how to, how to compare the rel relative merits of, of statements that can be so different from each other. And I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna um, point out a couple of things to think about, about uh, in regard to how to begin to address these challenges. Um, one, I think, concerns uh, uh, what Dr. Marnin basically uh, talked about a little bit, just the, the evaluation rubric, having a rubric that is uh, detailed and is going to serve the purposes of um, you know, what you're trying to accomplish, which is kind of to fairly and consistently evaluate these statements. Um, one thing I think is useful here is maybe to like try it out. <laughs> so uh, part of, I think, what makes a rubric uh, uh, less useful than it could be is if um, you sort of have developed it without any idea of what you're actually going to get in 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 the end when you um, are actually evaluating these statements. Um, so that is, I think, an important consideration. And the the first part of this, I think, is rewinding to the beginning, um, thinking about like actually what do you want or expect for this statement to contain, and that I think is going to go back to actually how you formulate the request. Um, and I'm out of time, so I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Cheng. Now we uh, move to the next panelist, uh, Dr. Dibolina Roy. Let me just share my screen. Uh, thanks, Karen, for the invitation. And I wanna uh, thank Seth and Charles for going before and setting a lot of the groundwork. Um, one of the things that Seth mentioned is really the diversity statement is one tool. In a, in a project. And I do think that it's important to see it as a piece of a bigger kind of story and narrative that your institution is really, how are they thinking about diversity? Um, you can't solve all the diversity questions by developing the best diversity statement tool <laughs> or rubric, but it is a part of the process. And so, you know, I thought I'd give a little bit of background of uh, here at Emory, what we've been doing and how the diversity statement kind of fits into how we've been thinking about diversity in, in broad ways. Um, you know, so I stepped into the role of Dean of Faculty um, about two years ago now. And what we've been doing in this office is really linking the hiring process, the, you know, the nuts and bolts of the hiring process to what happens when that process is carried out 
what kind of faculty are we attracting? Who is who have we been able to keep here with retention? And so I've decided to kind of highlight what that activity of thinking about diversity during a search process and using those diversity statements, what could be the outcomes of that? And so part of it is really highlighting the type of faculty that we've been able to attract, their accomplishments, and making this kind of a very public facing uh, part of what the Office of Faculty does. Um, we also have been thinking, you know, uh, everybody talks about uh, excellence uh, in research, you know, we're an R1 institution. And so uh, we do expect excellence in research. We also expect excellence in teaching. Often the conversations are around diversity and excellence, right? That these two things can kind of work hand in hand. Um, in, in more recent years, uh, the type of narrative that we've been from the Dean's office sending out is not, yes, diversity and excellence can work hand in hand, but we can also think of diversity as excellence. And that I think is also an important point um, when you are you know, uh, evaluating candidates, having those conversations of what is that pool gonna be? How do you think about that job ad if you think through that lens of diversity as excellence? So, you know, for every search, you know, diversifying our faculty is of primary importance. And, uh, you know, Emory has a diverse student body. We're here in the South. Our demographics are changing. We've really been trying to communicate that Emory needs to think of itself as an institution that is here to support our students. Without our students, we would not be anywhere. And so knowing who our students are and um, you know, what their needs are gonna be in the classroom, what kind of questions they wanna be able to uh, ask and answer, that has to be reflected in the type of faculty that they get to have in that classroom with them. And so all faculty, you know, we are applying for people that were, um, you know, and whenever there's a job search and an ad out, we are requiring diversity statements. And I think uh, I, I should have, you know, looked up this date, but I believe we've been doing so for about five or six years, diversity statements have been required. Um, and something that, you know, uh, Charles just mentioned, we have, I was looking at our diversity statements and many of them are required to describe their experiences and vision regarding the teaching and mentorship of students. That's one way that we have these candidates communicate to us what place does diversity hold uh, you know, in their work and when they arrive here, how are they going to um, uh, contribute to that? So uh, in, a, in addition to the college and the Office of Faculty and the efforts that we have here, uh, my office works with the Emory University um, Office of Equity and Inclusion uh, we partner with them. Um, this is a, uh, the links to these sites are also in this slide deck. Um, but there, this is a more recent office that has developed a whole bunch of best practices um, and kind of how do you form that search committee. It's a great resource. Uh, and in fact, I would say that what we've been doing here in the college for the last five or six years has been used as kind of the basis for developing a lot of the university practices as well. So uh, just kind of some of the logistics and steps, uh, you know, with that kind of idea and lens, uh, we do hold uh, sessions and training for our faculty who participate in hiring and in searches. Every year at the beginning of the year when um, lines are authorized, uh, the Dean of Faculty, uh, you know, holds this session. And um, what I do here is, uh, in fact, go through the hiring process step by step. The actual, you know, um, from search authorization to developing the job ad to having your materials reviewed by our affirmative action committee. So uh, the college has had an affirmative action committee also uh, that follows every step for every single search that we do, and they're active kind of participants in the whole authorization process. So I have the chair of that uh, uh, affirmative action committee also. Uh, um, present. And we have someone from that office of OEI from the Emory University administration share um, department hiring goals. And this is, you know, nationally collected data for every single discipline. Um, and it is a hiring goal. So for example, a department can learn while they're about to start off on this search that, you know, when it comes to African American faculty, the pool that's available nationally is, you know, here, maybe I'm just making this number up, it's at 30% your department here at Emory uh, has 
right? So you, a hiring goal would be to like match the kind of level of representation that is nationwide in your discipline, right? So that is something that they, you know, uh, and I think this is something that Seth um, mentioned, the search process could unfold in another way, but just knowing that this was a goal starting off, it does help to inform the discussions. Um, okay, and so we also write, run these implicit bias workshops for search committees, and um, all faculty who are serving on a search committee are required to participate. Um, and so we hold several sessions. Uh, they're led by the chair of the Affirmative Action Committee, and we also have the Office of Equity and Inclusion trained uh, facilitators in the college who um, run the session with me. Uh, every single search committee member is actually required to do one of these sessions. And the sessions, uh, yes, we learn about implicit bias, but it is also about the kind of technical side of developing that job ad of what is a diversity statement going to look, you know, um, what are you looking for when you're getting that? What is the rubric? We actually break it down during these sessions. Um, so this is the rubric, actually, that we're using. Uh, it's it's been developed actually based on the uh, UC Berkeley's rubric for assessing candidate contributions to DEI. But uh, this particular form is this Emory brand of it was developed by uh, two students, uh, one, uh, a graduate student uh, that participated in a um, biology search last year, as well as a, a postdoc in the biology department. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story here. And, um, you know, how when you make diversity as a, like um, uh, kind of a, a, a narrative that is, you know, being um, kind of told in different spaces that it can produce all these other kind of really rich conversations. This is exactly what happened in the biology department. So they developed this rubric to say, okay, like what could be a problematic approach to DEI, right? When someone's writing that um, diversity statement, you know, simply stating that, you know, I'm a, I'm a BIPOC person and Therefore, you know, that's my diversity statement. That's, that's not good enough. Um, so this is a, a rubric that we walk through in that uh, implicit bias uh, session as well, where how do they value and understand diversity, equity, inclusion? What is the track record in advancing DEI work, their track record in mentoring and plans for advancing it and institution building? So uh, to follow up with that, there is an evaluation tool once faculty do see all the different candidates. Um, and here again, they have to uh, comment on the diversity statement that was received. But I want to share with you that the two students who were on the biology search committee, they recently published uh, a paper that came out in Nature um, together. They, you know, it's called a model for diversity in faculty recruitment, where they speak about the value of that diversity statement. And I encourage you to, to look into that. I've put the link in this as well. Um, one thing that biology did, in addition to involving these students, re, uh, creating that rubric, they also followed up with shortlisted candidates with uh, a questionnaire after they had done their campus visit to say, how did that process go for you? Uh, what was it like writing that DEI um, diversity statement? Um, the faculty also decided that once they collected the diversity statements and the candidate had visited, to kind of create a story about the, the shortlisted candidates um, or the longlisted candidates of how did the DEI uh, contributions actually come forward. So just this exercise of having to reflect and think about it and not just tick boxes, I think also had a, a, an important impact. So these are the resources for our, um, you know, diversity statements for writing them up here. We're borrowing from a lot of the, uh, you know, institutions that are out there that are doing amazing work. Um, and, you know, we're just giving it an Emory flavor, but this is a project that I think not one institution can do on its own um, and get it completely right. We're all working on this together and the people are at different stages. Um, I know that Emory has actually come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Dr. Roy. Um, our final panelist is Dr. Chelsea Specht. Hi, thank you all for being here and for letting me speak. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. Um, and then um, I'm gonna go a little quickly just for the interest of time. And also because my fellow panelists have just done such a great job framing the questions and the issues and all of the elements. So of course, going last, I knew many of the things I said would be 
um, have already been said. And as an academic, I tend to just say it again because we all like to hear ourselves speak. So I'm gonna to try to avoid doing that. Um, can you all see my screen and the regular view? Okay, awesome. And I just wanna bring up um, something that Dr. Roy just mentioned that I thought was really important um, is that we're not doing this in a vacuum and we shouldn't feel like we are. Um, borrowing from other institutions is part of the process. I work um, as the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion for the College of Ag and Life Sciences, and we often get together with others of us who are in this DEI space, and we talk about how the biggest waste of time is to, is to create something new when, in fact, others have done it, have experienced it, have evaluated it, and can let you know what works and what doesn't work, and you can modify it for your own brand, your own values, your own um, constituencies. And so that is just something that's really critical if we are to move forward in um, diversity, equity, inclusion work more broadly. So um, I framed this as um, thinking about this as contributions to diversity. We, we call them diversity statements as sort of short language, um, but I'd like to recognize that what we're really thinking about is an individual's contributions to diversity as, as, as what the statement involves. And the, um, at Cornell, they're required for all faculty hires across our various colleges, across the university. And um, I just want to, again, try not to repeat what others have said, but for me, the diversity statement, it really completes the package. And one of the things that I learned recently is that many R1 universities used to not have a teaching statement. So there was a research statement because they were hiring you to do research, but there was not a teaching statement. And so I ask you, what does that indicate to you about the university? You're going to a job and if teaching was valued, wouldn't they want to know what the new colleague would do as a teacher, how they would perform in the classroom, what novel skills they're going to bring, what insights, what positionality they're going to bring to the teaching. And then we would hire people as faculty members and complain that they couldn't teach, but still give them tenure, not really worry about it. And I feel like diversity statements are in that category as more universities are adopting them. What does it mean if you're applying to a university that doesn't have a diversity statement as a requirement? What does that mean about how they're going to see you, how they're going to listen to you, how they're going to value your work? What if what you do, part of your inclusivity and belonging is really part of what you do, just as is your teaching and your research, and you realize that that institution isn't going to value that part of you? So this is a recruitment tool. Having a contributions to a diversity statement is part of a recruitment tool, and I think it's really important that we see it that way. Um, this also is, was in response to people would say, well, what if, are we really going to force people to write another statement? And you're like, um, it's a statement that gives an opportunity for them to share your values. One thing that I also think is really important is these are just taken from different universities. Um, I, I often do workshops to help um, students and postdocs write diversity statements. And so I use this to show to them that the opportunity to write the diversity statement is also your university's opportunity to put out your values to say what you're looking for and to say, we want somebody who's going to help us achieve these particular values. So again, these are all very personal as far as these institutions are concerned. Um, the individuals can, de can decide how they want to respond to that in a very personal way, but it gives the everybody evaluating those applications an opportunity to really um, know the person in a way that they won't be able to know them from their research and their teaching statements. Um, I think it is an important way for, as again, an individual to be able, and, and um, uh, before me, um, all of you amazing panelists have talked about what it is should, that should be in that diversity statement, but it is the opportunity to, for the institution to talk about what knowledge it has and what it, um, the, and the individual candidate to express their knowledge and core values, the experience of the problem, their positionality, um, how they're going to use that positionality to shape the commitment and the work that they do. Um, and then also the future directions. And we do a very similar faculty will often say, well, I can't evaluate these contributions to just a diversity statement. I'm not an expert in it. Yet we can evaluate a research statement by looking at what they've done, you know, what, how they frame the picture, uh, their, their research questions, how they're, um, what they've done, and then what their action is, what they will do when they get to your institution. And so we were asking the same thing out of those diversity statements. Um, it also gives the candidates an opportunity to really understand the university that they're applying to or college that they're applying to um, and explore, you know, what, what are they going to bring and what resources are already available 
do they demonstrate knowledge of those resources all are, are available? Do they go onto the website? Do they look for those things? Are they incorporating that into their future plans? Um, how, um, what resources do they have? And then how will they, um, in a sense, evaluate you as an institution that's going to enable them to be able to do that aspect of their work? So just as when you're thinking about a research statement, you're like, do they have growth chambers? You know, do they have, you can say, do they have a DEI committee? Does that committee is effective? Has it been able to institute change? How are their graduate student mentoring programs? And so that candidate is given an opportunity to engage in the university in a, in a much more meaningful way, um, even before they begin that interview process. So um, I just wanna quickly, cause I do wanna leave time. Again, I said that this is, this is at Cornell. We use, when we ask for the applicants to, to do their statement of contribution to diversity, we use this as an opportunity to share our values. And then I just wanna end with saying that um, I, it is part of a toolkit and I could not appreciate more um, Dr. Martin, your presentation. I'm going to go back to this recording and force a lot of people to watch this at my institution because you said it and I feel like you said all the things that I'm saying so many times, but it was just so really well, um, really well stated and very clear. And I wanna say that part of this is the awareness of the search committee. So the composition of the search committee, who's on it, what is their commitment? As they're thinking about the rubric for evaluating the contributions to diversity statement and the rubric for how that's going to fit into their overall evaluation. It forces them into a dialogue about their commitment and their values. They find share values and it can make that job ad so much more rich because they're defining that as part of the search process from the beginning. And then as you go through that search process, think about that, the composition of your pool. Have you reached out to people? Have you made those phone calls? Have you gotten a composition of that you've invested in getting people to apply to this position? And then you've invested in evaluating them to think about your long list, your short list, and your interview list. Does it continue to reflect the diversity of your candidate pool? And does it continue to reflect the values that you demonstrated in your job ad? I also just want to say the worst enemy of a search committee is time. So stop, listen, listen to the people on the search committee. Don't allow those hierarchies to come into play and breathe and take the time. And if you have to stop and pause, stop and pause. There's no, there, there is an urgency. I know we're all fighting for the same candidates right now, but, um, but think about how that urgency can cause biases to really creep into the search process all along the way. And then I just also wanna advocate for thinking about hiring in clusters or cohorts, because that can help people with marginalized identities um, come together as a group and be able to um, leverage and value and share those identities as they um, come to our campuses. Um, so I'm gonna end there and hopefully there's some time for some panel discussion. Let me stop sharing. Thank you very much, Dr. Specht. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. Um, now feel free to uh, add your question to the chat, but um, you are also welcome to use the raise hand function under reactions. And there is already a question by uh, Dr. Benjamin. Yeah, so I'm very interested. I work with a lot of scientists, I'm in STEM, and there is a huge emphasis on where is the data? Where is the data that this makes a difference? It, it makes complete and intuitive sense to me. Where are the randomized trials? Where is the data? And I, I would love to hear you react to that. I, I'm a believer, just to be clear. I'm a bet I'm I need to convince everybody else. I'm happy to share if that's okay. Um, you know, I prepare in that workshop, the recruitment workshop, it's actually all about data and how you know, including uh, DEI focus and the, all these processes, including the statement makes a difference. So let me just pull up a slide that I was putting together for another presentation. Um, let's see. So this is one of the slides that I show. This is when we started asking for statements around this time. <laughs> And so Emory College, our numbers of like uh, faculty who uh, you know come from historically underrepresented groups, this is what we've been able to do over the last five years. 
And maybe that's directly related to, you know, the statements. It's a piece of it, you know, as I've said, but this is when we really started thinking about the hiring process and how do we reconfigure. So our data is showing that it's making a difference. Um, you know, uh, and then I, I show all kinds. And so then we have a women in STEM uh, included as well um, and how that's made a difference. So I think that's a really important approach to take uh, when you are trying to, you know, work with faculty who work with data um, to get the, say that this is a, a worthwhile effort. I just really want to thank you for sharing those data and I screen captured it. Um, I think that's fantastic. I also want to say that I know as a scientist and you hear the, you know, are there the data? I'm so glad to see that there are. I also want to um, mention that there's also ripple effects to all of these patterns in which you can, when a search committee feels pride in their candidate pool, um, you can see that there's taking care and moving that candidate forward and they're thinking about those candidates. And so you can look at the final list of interviews and I've just had search committees come and say, well, we have, um, in a particular case, we have five top candidates, four are women. We're going to just interview the four women because we know what happens when we bring the one male to candidate. That's just one case. And I don't want to say this is happening across the board and any group is being marginalized in any way. But there's as there's dialogues going on, um, I think the numbers are there. But also I want to just emphasize to those scientists, like be, be OK with feeling like with those, with that sensation that it is working, you're seeing this happening to the campus. You're feeling more engaged with the search process, and all of that is impactful. It's the numbers, it's the composition, but also the feeling of inclusivity that arises when you're intentional about these processes throughout the search, and when you're intentional about your your future colleagues that you're bringing to campus. Okay, uh, let's continue with another question. I see Dr. Uh, Jonathan Matthews. I'm sorry, I can't see the full name, has uh, his hand raised. Thank you so much. I, I truly appreciate the panel. And, and you know, uh, like Dr. Benjamin just wanted to say that I, I am a believer in um, diversity statements as well. Um, I'm a faculty affairs and diversity coordinator at the dental school. And um, you know, this is the idea of a diversity statement is something that we are actively working on um, and that we actively do require for, for new candidate searches. Um, there's, a, there's some statements that we received in return, and I'm just curious of, about the panel's reaction to some of the statements that we've received um, in, in, in requesting a diversity statement. First, um, you know, the question arises, do your current faculty have diversity statements on file? Um, if it's a requirement for new faculty that are coming in, um, you know, we did receive some statements like that. Another one would be, am I going to be reviewed based on my statement? And does that create a secondary standard in which some, if there are no diversity statements for some, but there are for others, does it create a dual standard on that aspect of it? And then lastly, you know, we, we received a really interesting comment about how asking an individual who was um, an identified under, you know, was a part of an un, um, underrepresented group, it, it felt to them that it was asking too much of them to put the onus on them to, to contribute to the growth of the university by putting the requirement and the statement that they would continue to contribute to our diversity. Um, when in reality, that should be us as a university's um, standpoint. I was, I'm just curious about the, the panel's thoughts on that. And thank you so much. Who would like to take this one? I'm happy to to share some thoughts. Um, so, I mean, I, I I think that universities, committees, um, you know, can change the kinds of questions that they ask of candidates over time, right? And and I think I can't remember who it was who talked about. Uh, at a certain point, not you know, a research university is not asking for teaching statements. That you know, previously there were no teaching statements asked, and then eventually people realize that you know, if you're going to have people teaching, that you want them to be able to be you know, excellent 
teachers as well as researchers and to ask. So, right, so that can change over time. Um, you know, just to be very clear, all candidates should be asked to provide the same materials, just to put that out there, right? And so if somebody was, some people were being asked for a statement like this and some were not, I would put some weight into that. But I think that over time things change and that that is simply the way it is and that, that you're trying to, to make it a better place, right? You're trying to increase the diversity, you're trying to serve the students, right? As our students become more diverse and have, you know, we want to have folks who are culturally competent and able to work with the students that we have. Um, and so I think that that is a, a, you know, a perfectly reasonable thing to do and a positive thing to do. And, and I think that that's, you know, what the goal is. I think also that, uh, you know, that the candidates are future we, right? Mm -hmm. That they, you know, so when we say it's on the institution to be doing this work, that it, it, if you want to come to this institution and do the work with us, then you are a part of that team, right? And, and want to be contributing to it. And I think it's really important to, you know, I was asked a question recently. I, uh, the, I do, I am typically the one who is training. Our search committees are not uh, required to do training by anybody, but many of them do seek out training from our office and I'm the one who does that training. And, and was asked about, you know, when you're asking folks to, to uh, uh, submit diversity statements, you know, how do you, you know, white folks can make contributions, folks of color can make, right? And so how do you, if you're trying to diversify your faculty, like you, somebody could have a great diversity statement uh, without being a person of color themselves, without being an underrepresented minority, without being a woman, without being a queer person, whatever you know, you're, uh, you're trying to accomplish, you know, and, and we sort of talk through as a group, right? That there, there's sort of a Venn diagram here of like contributions and folks making those contributions. Um, and I think, you know, as, as I was listening to folks talking, I was thinking about the ways in which many of us over the years, um, you know, and, and, and lots of folks will talk about this, right? Particularly for underrepresented minorities, for women, for, for uh, LGBTQ plus people, right? There's all kinds of ways in which we serve our institutions for which we receive no credit, right? And this sort of unpaid uh, labor, unrecognized labor that we do all day, every day, right? Whether it's mentoring more students, whether it's being asked to serve on a committee, whether, you know, whatever the thing is, and that this is in fact a way <laughs> to get credit for that work. Right. And so I think sort of highlighting that is really important as well um, for that folks think, that this is an opportunity. Yeah. If I could just add to that. So, you know, like I said, diversity, it's, it's, it's a big story we're trying to create. And so um, I, one piece of it is that we are all in this together. So our faculty who are here, who have been here for five years, 10 years, 30 years, we've now implemented that uh, in the annual reviews people have to talk about their diversity work, right? And so we have a review system through Interfolio, we call it, it's Faculty 180, where you can put activities for your research, your teaching and service, and add a DEI tag to any of those, right? So some of us have been doing this DEI work in our research in every day in the classroom, and we're valuing that, right? So yes, we're asking diversity statements now of new, you know, more recently, but this is a project for everybody. And so once you arrive here, you become one of that we. Um, and I think that's that's a really good point. I will publish that information, <laughs> that data. I've got some requests here, so uh, I'll work on that. Um, I just want to add really quickly to the the concern about you know people worrying about what they wrote in their diversity statement, like <clears throat> being the basis for some like negative evaluation maybe later if they like didn't do what they said they were planning to do. I've never um, <clears throat> heard that same concern for research statements. Like, you know, someone might write in a research statement that they're planning to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so to be honest, I don't like fully understand that concern and, and whatever it is, I, I think that, you know, we, we, would, we would actually understand and kind of encourage people to, after they get to an institution and they better understand the landscape of what, what things are going on there to, appropriately adapt what their plans would be to contribute to DEIJ. Um, I don't think that that's, um, I don't I don't really think that that should be a concern, I think, in terms of, uh, of people's evaluations, so, yeah. Well, we have reached the end of our times. Thank you so much to the panelists. It was extremely informative and um, we will make this recording available on our website for all the faculties uh, to review. We are happy, of course, to share this with you panelists as well. 
And uh, thank you also uh, to everyone who attended. And um, please use the reaction buttons to say thank you to the panelists. Um, so again, thank you very much. And um, I will be in touch with the panelists. Take care, everyone.